Say good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone once again. Always a blessing to see the saints of God. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, our theme for the weekend, it's entitled, It's High Time. And our theme text is Romans 13, verse 11, and that known the time that now it is high time to do what? To awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Now, uh, for our Sabbath school time, since the court is on education, and I was asked to give a message, I thought, fitting with the theme, that we'll do something specifically showing the role of education and the three angels' messages. And we're going to go back and look at the history of education, how uh, it actually starts in heaven, translated to the Garden of Eden, translated to Ivy League schools, and now down to our time. And we need to find out if we are byproducts of false education. And uh, we want to study that this morning. But before we do, let us kneel, or bow your heads, and let's pray and ask God's presence as we jump right in. Lord, again, we're asking for your wisdom and your guidance, especially on this subject, Lord. I know that I lack it, and I'm asking for you because you promised that you give us liberally. So now as we embark upon this subject, I pray that you give wisdom, understanding, and application. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Education and the three angels' messages. Now, I'm going to share with some, uh, some startling statements to begin with. And the statements are found in Fundamentals of Christian Education. And I'll share with you the reference. But I want you to notice what this says. It said, the light has been given me that tremendous pressures will be brought upon every Seventh-day Adventist with whom the world can get into close connection. Then it says, those who seek the, what's the next word? Education. Education. That the world esteems so highly are gradually led farther and further from the principles of truth until they become what? Education. Educated whirlings. Then it asks the question, at what price have they gained their education? They have parted with the Holy Spirit of God. They have chosen to accept that which the world calls knowledge in the place of the truths which God has con committed to men through the ministers and the prophets and apostles. Then it says, and there are some who having secured this worldly education think that they can introduce it into what? Into our schools. But let me tell you that you must not take what the world calls the higher education and bring it into our schools. And what else? And sanitariums. And churches. We need to understand these things. I speak to you definitively, definitely. This must not be done. Now, I don't know if a more potent statement than this when it comes to education. Now, uh, just a quick summary, and then I'm going to come back and share more details of this. The prophet of God was advocating that this kind of education be carried forward in our schools. And you know what they did? They were so against it that they sent her off to Australia. And you know what she did? She said, all right, since you guys don't believe it, I'm going to demonstrate it. So while she was in Australia, she started up the Avondale School, where she was actually carrying out God's plan. Now, while she was doing this, she was sending letters uh, to the conference, and of course, they were rejecting it, except for Sutherland and McGann. They, they took the councils to heart. And Sutherland was asked to become president of Emmanuel Missionary College. Does anyone know what school that is now? Andrews. Andrews. And he was meeting much obstacles, much trials along the way. To the point where he was giving up. He was like, you know what? I've tried, I've tried, and I'm done. And when he was walking out, he went and grabbed his mail. And he was getting ready to go and resign and quit. Met with much obstacles. It's amazing how God's timing the work. Then he opened up the letter. You want to know what the letter said? I'll show you what it says right now. It says, now... As never before, 
We need to understand the true science of education. Now, I want you to read this yellow with me because this is explosive. Read it with me. It says, if we fail to understand this, we shall never have a place in the kingdom of God. Wow. Serious statement. Then it goes on. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And then it ends by saying, if this is the price of heaven, shall not our education be conducted on these lines? So saying the science of true education is essential. It is life essential. It is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. And then she says, if this is the cause of heaven, shall not our education be conducted along these lines? Which leads to my next question. Now, what is education? Is it just gathering some books and some pencils and reading? What is education? Is it this cookie cutter confined to the building uh, with a set rules of classes or a fixed time? Is it following the societal norms of you know, being born and getting your education and getting your career so that you can eventually get married so that you can have a family and then so you can retire? Is, is that the object of education? No. Well, if that's what we think, then it says here, often... The education and, lifetime, uh, education and training of a lifetime must be discarded that one might become a learner in the school of Christ. And I realized, being a byproduct of false education myself, there's a lot that I had to throw out when I begin to understand these principles. So then, what is education? Well, you find that our ideas of education are take too narrow and too low a range. Now, if it's too narrow and too low, what do we need? Something that's broader and higher, right? And I love inspiration. Notice what it says. It says there is need of a broader scope and a higher aim. Now, when you think about education, when you think about the gospel, when you think about Christ and what he wants to do for us, it all boils down to one thing. God gets the glory, man does not. That's what the entire gospel is about. And that's what caused Satan to fall. That's what caused Adam and Eve to fall. They wanted glory that did not belong to them. And that's the, the, the purpose of education is to bring the true understanding of justification by faith. And what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man to the dust and doing something for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. It is an understanding that Christ has some things that he does that is impossible for us to do. And true education in the right setting brings this out with great clarity. The part that man is required to sustain is immeasurably small, we're told. Yet in the plan of God is just the part that's needed to make the work of a success. We need to have this simple faith. Now, you must be thinking, you know, what, what does faith and what does laying the glory of man and having simple, what does this have to do with true education? What does this have to do with education? Well, my brothers and sisters, we must ask these questions. Could it be that we have gone away from God's plan of simple faith? Could it be that our institutions are set up in such a way that man gets the glory and not God? Amen. Which is a direct opposite of the three angels' messages. Remember, our, what's our subject this morning? Education and the three angels' messages. Let's go to the first angel's message. By the way, where are the three angels' messages found? Where are they found? Revelation chapter 14. What is the next event after the three angels' messages? What is it? The second coming of Christ. So is there anything more important than these? There's not, because these are the messages that ushers in the second coming of Christ. It encompasses everything. Now let's look at the first angel's message. Where's the first angel's message found? What verses? Six and seven. Verse 6 and 7. Let's read that. The Bible says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that did what? Made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, let's pause and look at this for a second. What is justification by faith? Laying the glory 
of man to the dust. What is the first angel's message? Fear God and give glory, glory to him. Do you guys see the connection? So the purpose of the three angels' messages is so that God can get the glory. And in order for God to get the glory, our glory must be laid to the dust. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, And worship him that made the heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountain of waters. In looking at this first angel's message, we see a lot. It tells us, number one, who gets the glory. It tells us the time in which we live. We're living in a time of God's judgment hour. It also tells us where our educational program should be conducted. You must be saying, I don't see that. Well, let's see that. What gives God glory and shows what he has made? Does that give God glory? Does these man-made structures with brick and mortar, does God get glory for that? Man could say that this is the great buildings that I have built. Can they not? Yes. Is that what Nebuchadnezzar said? Is this not the great Babylon that I have built? And by the way, Dr. Kellogg said almost the very same thing about the Battle Creek Sanitarium when he built this massive structure. So we see that these buildings and structures that's man-made gives man the glory and not God the glory. We're looking at true education in three angels' messages. Now, with that said, what about this? Can man take credit for this? Can he say, look at these mountains that I have made? Can he say, look at these rivers and these seas and these oceans that I have made? Can man do that? No. So the first angel's message said, worship him that has made. This tells us that in our educational program, it must be in a setting that God gets the glory and not man. Do you guys see that? So automatically tells us that God's educational program should be in the country and not in the cities. Because cities are man-made, and we're told that those who departed from God made to themselves cities. And when we're in a country, the serene environment with the valleys and the mountains and the hills and the creeks and the birds and the bees and the trees, and the, you see the animals, you say, man, this is what God has made. Am I making sense to anyone? So the first angel's message calls for creator. It calls to, uh, for our glory to be left in the dust, even when it comes to our educational program. Now, when we look at our educational program, what is the ABC? And that tells us that we're all high school dropouts. Amen? Amen? Because we're told that agriculture is the A, B, and C of educational training. Why, is, why agriculture? Why, agri why is it so important that agriculture, she, she says it over and over again, it is the ABC of industrial training. She also says it's the ABC of all our education. Why? Well, let's see why. Now, let, let's look at this. By the way, can man get glory for this? Agriculture teaches righteousness by faith more than anything else. Because it shows that there's a part that we play and also shows that there's nothing that we could do in a certain part. Let me explain. Now, if I'm farming, I have, to, I have to factor in a few things. I have to make sure that where I'm putting the farm, it has adequate sunlight. I have to make sure that the, the soil is mineralized. I have to make sure that the soil is watered. I have to make sure that I've created the best conducive environment for the plant to thrive. And then after I've done that, then I dig a hole and then I put a seed in the hole. I have done all that I humanly can. What do I do next? Nothing you can do but pray, right? Can you cause that seed to sprout, yes or no? It's the same thing in life. God is saying that's why agriculture is so important. It teaches what I humanly can do, but it also teaches my inadequacies and my incapabilities. I do my very best realizing that my very best is still not good enough. I'm still called to do all that I can, realizing all that I can cannot cause a seed to sprout. Now let me tell you what you don't do. You don't just lay in your bed and say, Lord, I'm praying that you know, the soil is mineralized. I'm praying that the soil gets water. I'm praying that it gets minerals. I'm praying that a seed drops in the ground. And I'm praying that a plant sprouts. You don't do that because that's, that's, that's foolish, right? You do your part. God does his part. 
You do your part, God does his part. And all that you do is still not good enough. You cannot change your heart. You cannot, hard, you cannot germinate a righteous character. Am I making sense? Amen. You can put yourself in the best environment, just like we put the, the seed in the best environment, but at the end of the day, we have to depend upon God to cause that seed to sprout. Amen. So right in the first angel's message, we see that God gets the glory. We see why agriculture is so important. We see why we must be in a country. The first angel's message beckons us in our educational program on how it should be conducted. Does that make sense so far? So what about the second angel? Now let's look at the second angel. The second angel's message says what? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is falling. What are the next three words? That great city. The first angel's message said, come to the country where God has made, and now it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This tells us that the second angel's message beckons us for true education. Why? It tells us that city is not a good environment. They're falling, and we need to come out of Babylon, that great city. Then you also see that in the second angel's message, it is a corruption of nature. You know what wine is? It's a corruption of the grape. It's a, it's a fermentation of the grape. So God is saying that which is natural is what was needed. And Satan said, I'm going to take that which is natural and pervert it. Am I making sense? So then another angel comes and says in Revelation chapter 18, the loud cry, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. So now he's saying, I tell you, come out of Babylon, come out of that corruption, because you're going to be a recipient of her plagues. Why? Because it is a great city, and it has perverted and corrupted nature. Just keep that in mind. Now, Ye Sutherland, who was one of the fathers of true education under the instructions of the prophet, he says this. We call our older brethren out of Babylon, but we let our children attend the Egyptian ways. Now, this is written in the early 1900s, maybe 1908 or so, or whenever it was. Of all the places that Sutherland could have mentioned, why Egypt? Why Egypt? Atheism, secularism, and you know what Egypt was known for? They were known for their educational system. They were the, the number one kingdom in the world in the time of Moses, and they also had the number one uh, educational system in the world in the time of Moses. In fact, go to, go to, uh, go to Acts chapter 7. Go to Acts 7. Let's, let, let me let you see for yourself. We're seeing how the three angels' messages connect with true education. Go to Acts chapter 7. I want you to see it for yourself. And notice what it says in Acts. You can read uh, 22 all the way down to 30, but we're not going to do it for the sake of time. Go straight to verse 22. Egypt was a city, and Egypt was known for their educational system, and Egypt was the number one kingdom in the world. Notice what it says in Acts 7 and verse 22. The Bible says, And Moses was learned in all the what? The wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. So the Bible says that Egypt was known for their wisdom. And Moses learned this wisdom in Egypt. And when he learned this wisdom in Egypt, he says, yes, I'm finally ready to go and deliver my people out of Egypt. My 40 years of training has finally qualified me. You know what God said to him? He says, often the education and training of a lifetime must be discarded that one might become a learner in the school of Christ. God says, Moses, everything you've learned for the last 40 years, I need you to throw it out. In fact, I'm going to take you out of the city where you learn the 
wisdom and I'm going to take you to Midian and what you've learned for 40 years, I'm going to teach it for you another 40 years how to get rid of it. And for 40 years, he was in the, the mountains and the hills in the region of Midian. And you know what he did with his degrees? He took it and he became a shepherd. And with the shepherd, as, as a shepherd, God was teaching him the tenderness and the lowliness and the meekness and the lessons of nature. And after 40 years, Moses says, now remember when he finishes Egyptian education, he says, I am ready. Right. That's what false education does. You think you have might and power of yourself. When God re-educated my friends and God says, Moses, you're ready. Moses said, no, I'm not ready, Lord. And God says, praise God, now you're ready. Your glory is laid to the dust. You guys catch what I'm saying, my friends? True education lays the glory of man to the dust so that God can do something for them that they do not have power to do for themselves. So God had to re-educate Moses and get rid of that Egyptian education so that he could now be qualified by going through the school of Midian. Amen? So why Egypt? All right. Now, Egypt was known for their wisdom, as we saw. He was learning all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now we know that that's worldly wisdom. But he was learning in the, Egypt, with the wisdom of the Egyptians. Now the educational system from Egypt was now translated to Greece. And the education from Greece is now translated to Rome. So you have this e Egyptian education, which Greece took. And then you have the, the Greek wisdom that Rome took. And Solomon says, we call our brethren out of Babylon, but we let our children attend the Egyptian ways. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians. You see that right here, the Bible says that Egypt was known for wisdom. What does it say about uh, the Greeks? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me find the verse for you. Look at verse 20, start at verse 21. Start at verse 20. It says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made the foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that is the wisdom of God, the world by the wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now watch what it says in verse 22. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after what? Wisdom. wisdom. What wisdom did they take? They took the wisdom from Egypt, and now they have the wisdom in Greece. And now Rome took the wisdom from Greece, and now we're living uh, in the so-called Roman wisdom. Wisdom of the world. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, we have something called Ivy League schools. Let's go through our educational history. So, we, one of the, the main ones here in the United States is Yale. And this is from the book, Education in the United States. It says, the regulations for the most part were those of Harvard as also the course of study. So, in other words, Yale took its course and its curriculum from where? From from Harvard, but where did Harvard get its course and curriculum for? Harvard, uh, President Dunster said, patterned the, the, the Harvard course largely after that of the English universities. Again, this is the book Education in the United States. Then you have the English universities such as William and Mary. These are high Ivy League schools. And it says, all were of English patterns. Oxford, Cambridge, Eton, Rugby, Westminster. So when you look at Oxford and Cambridge and so on and so forth, where did they get their educational system from? Oxford and Cambridge model themselves largely after Paris. Now let's find out what about the University of Paris. It says, it was because it, the University of Paris, was the center of theological learning that it received so many privileges from who? From the Pope and was kept in close relation to the papal see. So here it is. Ivy League schools got their pattern from the English schools. 
English schools got their pattern from the Paris school, and the Paris school was approved, and the curriculum was highly built by the papacy in Rome. That's why Selene say, we allow, we call our brethren out of Babylon, but we allow our children to attend the Egyptian ways. In other words, they still go to the schools, and we're calling them out of Babylon, but yet they're still receiving a Babylonian education because Rome, my brothers and sisters, has a system of Babylon. That's right. <laughs> now, a double standard. Now, let's, let's, let's look at this a little bit further. Let, let's, go, let, let's, let, let's unveil a little bit deeper now and prove it from the Bible. Revelation 13. Let's go there together. Revelation chapter 13. Now, when it comes to the education, this is a, a rough one uh, for Adventism because we pride ourselves on education. Revelation 13. Notice what the Bible says in verse 1 and 2. It says, and I, heard, and I sit upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the horns ten crowns, and upon the heads the name of blasphemy. And the Bible says, and the beast which I saw, I want you to go through this with me, was like unto a what? And the feet like were as the feet of a? And the mouth as the mouth of a? And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and also great authority. So they call this the composite beast. What do those three characteristics or three animals that makes up this beast, what do, where do they come from? What does it remind you of? Daniel chapter 7. Lion was? Babylon. Bear was? Medo-Persia. And the leopard was? Now, let's pause. What is Greece known for? Wisdom and education. As you look at this beast, which animal takes up the majority of this beast's body? The leopard. The leopard. So if, if you go back and study, I'm, I, I don't, don't want to divert too much, but Babylon was known for its riches and wealth. Still to this day, known as the richest country ever. Pure gold all over Babylon. Then, what was per Medo Persian known for? You know what they were known for? Their unchangeable laws, right? Greece was known for their philosophy. wisdom slash philosophy. Yeah. Notice that the majority of the body of this beast is Greece. That means this number one point of attack is not force anymore. They started with force. And when they started with force, they said, you know what? The more we kill people is the more Christians are being raised up. So they say we have to move away from force. And when they moved away from force, you know what they went to? Education. Deception through the lens of education. That's why this beast, his a composite beast, has the majority of it as a leopard. Now, why a leopard body? Why a leopard of anything? What does the leopard mean? Well, somebody said it. Stealth, Stealth right? And the, Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24 says, Can a leopard change its spots? That tells us that the means to an end might change, but not the purpose. So this tells us that this leopard beast, it might tr have a different mechanism or means of, uh, of getting to its agenda, but its agenda has not changed. So it moved away from force and persecution for 1,260 years when it snuffed out the life of 50 to 100 million Christians. But now it says, I still have to carry out my agenda because I don't change. And they find a different way of doing it. So now they use stealth. You guys see a leopard? <laughs> Do you think that most animals are going to notice that leopard? So here it is that there's an antelope or some kind of deer or... Some kind of animal just, you know, grazing at the grass and slowly grazing at the grass. And all of a sudden, the leopard just shh, comes right out and sinks its teeth in that animal's neck. So we're told that this leopard beast, just like a regular leopard, it moves with stealth. In fact, notice what it says here. It says, leopard, stealth, and camouflage, BBC. It says, when, uh, when they do hunt, they do so with stealth. Leopards are 
superbly camouflaged hunters uh, that creep to within a few meters of their unsuspecting quarry before lunging using powerful jaw muscles to exert a lethal hold. Rome has the majority of it as a leopard. Now, what's Rome's plot? It says, Romanism is now regarded to Protest by Protestants with a far greater favor than in former years in countries where Catholicism is not in, uh, in the ascendancy. It says, and the papists are taking a what? Concealatory course in order to gain influence. So it's saying Rome is not just going to de deal out of cards. It's, it's taking a conciliatory course. It's moving in a stealthy manner. And how's it doing it? With the majority of the body being a leopard, it's doing it through the educational system. Now notice what Sutherland said. He said the early reformers, we're still looking at the second angel's message. It says the early reformers realized that they could not hope to succeed if their children were educated by Roman Catholic teachers. Luther says that the Bible must be, uh, the, he said the Bible must be studied, teachers must be provided, schools must be established. Then it says the early reformers found it necessary to have their own course of study, their own textbooks, teachers, methods, principles, etc., etc. And then it says the command found in Revelation 18 verse 4 says, come out of her my people, means to come out of those institutions, which placed in the minds of our young people, worshipers of which we read in 2 Timothy 3 verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And then it says, as faithful watchmen, we should be just as desirous of getting our children out of the popular schools, as we are to call, or we are to call our older brethren out of the popular churches. And then it says, the popular churches are to only a product of what? Worldly education, my friends. So it says, to get at the root of the matter, we must separate ourselves from that which creates the condition in which all the religious world at present finds itself. So it says, as we call people out of the Babylonian churches, we must take our children and our family members out of the popular schools because all of our churches, all the secular churches, those churches in Babylon, are only byproducts of worldly education. All right. Now, what about the third angel's message? Let's look at it. Revelation. Go back to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and where's the three angels' messages found? The third angel's message found in Revelation 13. Where's that found? It's found in verse 9. So let's look at verse 9 through 12. Revelation 14, verse 9 through 12. We looked at the first angels briefly. We looked at the second angel briefly. Now we're looking at the third angel. Notice what it says now. Revelation 14, verse 9. It says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or in his hand, the saint shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and who shall receive the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, if you are to summarize the entire gospel from Genesis all the way back to Revelation, it's summarized in this question that Jesus asked the scribes and the Pharisees. Whose is the image and superscription? When it boils down to it, everyone is going to receive either the seal of God or the mark of the beast. Or, as the Bible says, the image to the beast. So the question can be asked, whose image and superscription do you have? That's what it says here. You receive the image of God or the image to the beast. Let's look at it now. That's Mark 12 and verse 16. That word image means likeness. That word image means representation, resemble, likeness in mind. And Jesus asked the question, whose is the image and superscription? That word superscription means writing and title. In other words, whose writing and whose title do you have? You know, you know what verse 1 of Revelation 14 says? Having the Father's name 
written in their foreheads. Revelation 22 verse 4 said the same thing. They shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Whose image and superscription? So we see that everyone will have one of two images. As we look at the third angel's message in education. And we're told time is almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? So in Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27, we see that man was made in the image of God, and then something happened, and then Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 12, we're warned not to receive the image of the beast. So we either have the image of God or the image to the beast. Now, by the way, where's the mark placed? It is placed where? In the forehead and in the hand. So how do you get the, the, this mark and how do you get the image? Well, it must be in the frontal lobe. And in the frontal lobe, we find that that's where reasoning, learning, and creativity are hallmarks of human intelligence. These abilities involve the frontal lobe of the brain. The frontal lobe subserves decision-making and executive control. So man was made in the image of God, Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. But now then you find in Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says that man was now made in the image of man. What happened between Genesis 1, where man is made in the image of God, and Genesis 5, where man is now made in the image of man? What happened? What, what happened between those, those, those chapters? Sin. It was none other than sin. So in order to leave the image of man to get back to the image of God, what must happen? That sin must be removed. I must be asking, what does this have to do with true education? Well, it has everything to do with true education. So what happened now? What happened? Well, let's find out what happened. Somebody said they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You guys catch that? Do you see what it has to do with education? They ate from the tree of knowledge and lost the image of God. Do you see how these three angels messed this time to education? When they ate from the tree of knowledge, they lost the image of God. And that's why the Bible says... I, must have you, I will have you wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning evil. God says, I want you to know the good, but you did not need to eat from the tree of knowledge. Now, it says here, we must learn to be content with what God does not want us to know. Amen. What does Deuteronomy 29, 29 say? The secret thing belongs unto the Lord our God, but that which is revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So God says, look, don't eat from the tree of knowledge because it will cause you to lose the image of God. The reason why people are going to receive the image of the beast, the reason why people are going to receive the mark of the beast and lose the image of God is because we have eaten from the tree of knowledge. Where does knowledge come from? It comes through education. Am I making sense? Now, what does this have to do with true education? What, 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 is, what does anything of this have to do with true education? This is so beautiful. By the way, uh, if you want to learn about education, you, you, there's two books that I recommend. The Bible and the book Education. <laughs> That's what it's called, the book Education. Fundamentals of Christian Education is great as well. But start with the book Education. Notice what the book Education says now. Listen, after they lost their image, it says, Yet... The race was not left without hope. To restore in man the image of his maker. You guys catch that? So they lost the image by eating of the tree of knowledge. So God says now to restore in man the image of his maker to bring him back to the what? Perfect. Now remember we said that the image of God is here and the image of man is here in Genesis 5. And what was in between? It was sin. So in order to get back to the image of God, they must lose the image of man, by getting rid of the sin so they could get back to the perfection in which he was created. It says now to promote the development of, what are the three things? Body, mind, and soul. So what should our education comprise of? Body, mind, and soul. That's why you see sitting in a classroom for eight hours without using your body is not true education. Body, 
mind, and soul. That the divine purpose in this creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. Now listen, this is the object of what, saints? Do you guys catch this, my friends? It says the object of education is to get men back to the image of God so that they do not get the image of the beast. The third angel's message in education, my friends. God desires for us to have his image. This is the object of education, the great object of life. Now let's go back in another layer. How did they end up eating from the tree of knowledge? Well, let's go back and find out what happened in heaven. We find here, it says in Story of Redemption, Christ had been taken into the special counsel of God in regard to his plans. While Lucifer was unacquainted with them, he did not understand, neither was he permitted to do what? To know the purpose of God. So you see where it started. He wanted to know something that God didn't want him to know. Am I making sense? So he had his own tree of knowledge, something that he wanted to know. What was the counsel? I like the way E.S. Sutherland breaks it down. It's from the story of redemption as well. But in his book, uh, The Living Fountains and Broken Cistern, E.S. Sutherland wrote it this way. He says, He who hovered over the throne of God turned his eyes inward. And listen now. He reasoned that he was wronged. What did he do? Reasoned that he was wrong. In fact, go to Ezekiel 28. The Bible actually says it. The Bible, I, mean, I love the Bible, my friends. Amen. Ezekiel 20, notice what it says in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 17. I'm hoping we're seeing the connection with the three angels' message in education. Ezekiel chapter 28, and notice what it says in verse 17. It says, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, thou was corrupted, thy wisdom. So he had wisdom that was what? Corrupted, right? Which we now call worldly wisdom. Egyptian wisdom, corrupted. Greek wisdom, corrupted. Rome wisdom, corrupted, right? He had reason that was corrupt, wisdom that was corrupted. Why was, it cor why was it corrupted? By reason of thy brightness. Then it says, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before the kings and that, that they may behold thee. So we see now, because of this reasoning, he was corrupted. Now, it says here, while Lucifer thus reasoned, wanted to know things that God didn't want to know, listen, Christ wrapped within the glory of the Father was offering his own life for the world at its creation. So listen, what was taking place? Christ and the Father was in counseling, they're saying, if they sin, Christ is saying, what are we going to do? I will give my life. You know what Satan was doing at the same time? He was saying, why does Christ get all the glory? While Christ is actually laying his own glory to the dust. Planning to literally lay his own glory to the dust by taking on the form of a man in humanity. Satan was exalting himself. I am beautiful. I can sing. I could do all these wonderful things. Why does Christ get all the glory? I want some glory for myself. That's how false education started, my friends. Reasoning. Then it says... How could that covering cherub at the moment when the Son of God laid down his life plan on his own exaltation, my friends? And that's why the Bible says, pride will go before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And it says, the principle of God's government were now laid bare. It was nothing but a great, broad system of what? Educational development. Are you guys seeing this, my friends? So as you look at God's system, we see that God's system is based on love, God's system is based on unselfishness, and God's system is based on faith. I believe what God says, period. Amen. You know what Satan says? Selfishness, reasoning, and doubt. Now, I think I should pause here to give you some illustrations of this. True education is believing what God says Amen. and acting on it. Even though it might seem like it makes no sense whatsoever. Now let me give you some examples. Here it is that they're getting ready to fight against Jericho. And then Moses said, well, Joshua says, Lord, I need a war strategy. 
And they're looking at the thick walls that chariots are being written, written on. And they're looking at the thick walls that surround Jericho. And there's no way to get in to defeat them. And God says, I have a war strategy for you. I want you to march around these walls 13 times. And when you get to the 13th time, blow the trumpets, begin to sing praises and talk about the Lord. And the walls will fall down. That's my war strategy. You know what they say? In their minds, they must be saying, this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And I could, I could imagine they, they, they might have said, you know, let me go back and study the histories of wars. And I'll go back and study the history of wars. I'm going to see that there's every time where a person marched around walls and then the walls fell down. And when they, after they'd done their intensive research and reasoning and so back, they came back with Joshua and says, Joshua, well, going back and studying the history of war, since we are, we are in the midst of a war, I have real, realized that this has never happened before. So I don't think this is, a good, this is a good war strategy, Joshua. Am I making sense? Yeah. <laughs> now here it is now. They are leaving Egypt. I'm just giving you some practical example. They're, they're leaving Egypt. They have mountains on either side. They have the soldiers behind them. And God says, go towards the Red Sea. And then as you step into the water, it's going to part. They said, well, let me think about this for a second. Um, I've been in Egypt for about you know, 40 years or 50 years, whatever, they, how old I am. And uh, I can honestly say that I've never seen water part like that before. So, Moses, you might want to come up with something different. I know you, you might be thinking that you're connected with God, but it makes no sense. Right? You know what God said? Go forward. Let me give one more. I mean, there's many, but I'll give one more. Here it is that Noah is building this ark. And they, they said, No, what you, you mind if I ask what are you doing? Oh, I'm building an ark. Why? Because there's a flood that's coming, Noah. Well, um, have you checked the scientific research? Because if you check the scientific research, you will realize that it has actually never rained before. And actually, if you look at the clouds, it, 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 there's no rain in the forecast. In fact, if you look at the forecast for the next thousand years, Noah, you see that there's no rain in the forecast, period. So I'm just wondering what you're doing. In fact, I don't even know what, what this rain is that you're talking about because it's just never happened before. It cannot be scientifically proven. Am I making sense? Well, Noah said, I hear what you're saying, but I've also heard what God said. Amen. By faith, Amen. Hebrews eleven seven, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Amen. So Noah moved by faith. He did not reason about what God said. He says, Lord, I hear what you said. I know that your word is, uh, in fact, God can't lie. Because if God says something and it never happened before, it's going to happen. Amen? <laughs> That's how much power is in the word of God. He has, his words have creative power. So when God speaks, we must remove the doubt. False education is based on doubting what the word of God says. Let me prove that. So when, uh, when Lucifer in the form of the serpent, well, Satan now, in the form of the serpent, started speaking to Eve. What's the first thing he said? Yeah. Has God. God said? Yeah. Doubting God's word and reasoning about what God's word already said. Am I making sense? Yeah. Christ now at age 12 recognized that he's in fact the son of God. And when Satan came, he says, if you are the son of God. You know what he wanted to crash? Doubt in who he was. So Satan's object is always to create doubt in the word of God. And, you know, that's, that's why I love the word of God. You know, when you, when you start talking to atheists and agnostics, you don't have to prove anything. Why do you believe that the world was created in seven days? Oh, because that's what the word of God said. Why do you believe that the world was created in 7,000 years? Well, this is the evidence, and I have all those, this evidence and so on. You have the Big Bang Theory, and they go through the whole thing. Then I say, okay, how do you prove that? Then they go back, then how do you prove that? And how do you prove that? And how do you prove that? And you know what happens after a while? They run out, because you can always trace it back to prove something. But as a Christian, I can say, 
I just believe what God says. That's all. It's a sense of peace, my brothers and sisters. That's what true education is, believing what God says and acting on it. Now, let's look at this now, the rival system. It says here, even Satan himself was almost one as the notes of praise resounded through the domes of heaven. But again, pride ruled. Here was born the rival system, supreme selfishness, facing the utter self-forgetfulness of Christ, reason over against faith. So what is the premise of false education? Reasoning and doubting what God said. Now we have to be careful. Now we, we, we might think about it in, in, in light of evolution and different things of that nature, but are there small things in our lives that God has asked us to do and we begin to reason? That's how you know the difference between a sheep, between sheep and goats. Goat says, I hear what you said, but. You, you guys catch it? Goats like the but. <laughs> Amen. but. But sheep, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice and follow me. So when you read the word of God and God asks you to give up anything in light of diet or dress or education or recreation, whatever it is, you don't but. You said, I'm a sheep, God. Praise God. Amen. All right, now, let's continue. Let's, let's look at it in the Bible now. So we see that it, it, it was this reasoning. Now, go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. This, this text, you might not have noticed it before, but it's, it is explosive. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Let's notice what the Word of God says. As we continue to look at education and the three angels' messages. Do you guys see the connection, my friends? Yes. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. All right, watch this now. Paul is given a solemn warning. And who is this he's warning? What church is this? Do, 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 do you guys know where they were and, how, and where they were closely connected with? Greece and Rome, right? Now watch the warning. It says here, Colossians 2 and verse 8, it says, Beware! Lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Paul says, beware of philosophy. All right, now, what is philosophy? Love of wisdom, reasoning, course of science read in the schools. That's the definition Love of wisdom, reasoning. Greece, wisdom. Egypt, wisdom. And Rome took the, the Greece and Egyptian education, and that's why it comprised the body, my friends. Now go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And notice what it says in verse 20 and 21. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20 and 21. Many counsels that Paul could have uh, uh, you know, shared with uh, Timothy, um, who was... Um, under the school of apprenticeship of, of Paul. And notice what he said to Timothy. He says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babbling and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith Grace be and peace be with you. So he said, look, Timothy, there's so many that I've seen that has erred to the faith through philosophy. There's so many that I've seen that erred in the faith through deceits. There's so many that I've seen that have erred in the faith through reasoning. He says, oh, Timothy, please don't do that. And let me say this. I've seen children, listen to me, homeschooled all the way up until college. Go to college. They hear philosophy in their class. I'm telling you actuality. And I'm talking more than one, one student. And now uh, one of them is an atheist. Another is an agnostic. Oh, Timothy, Paul says. Don't do it, Timothy. Avoid the science falsely so-called. And that's why we can't call our older brethren out of Babylon and allow our children to accept the Egyptian ways. No, my friends, don't do it, Timothy, Paul warned. And what is, what is the education about? 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 7 says, They are ever learning 
and never able to come to what? A knowledge of the truth. That's philosophy. You're always reasoning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. I believe that the word of God is truth, my brothers and sisters. In fact, you can go throughout the Bible. The Bible actually says the sanctuary is the truth. Praise God. Amen. That's in Daniel chapter 8. The Bible said that the Holy Spirit is the truth. How be he the spirit of truth? The Bible says Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. The Bible said the Sabbath is the truth. The Bible says the Father is the truth. And I believe, my brothers and sisters, that when I read the word of God, I have received the truth. Are you with me? Now, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Ever reasoning. Never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Notice what this says. This is an Encyclopedia Britannica. Article Socrates states, Before I ever met you, says Menno in the dialogue with Plato called by his name, I was told that you spent your time in the what? Doubting. And leading others to do what? To doubt. And it is a fact that your witcheries and spells have brought me to this condition. And it says, I respect faith, Wilson Meinzer says, but doubt is what gets you an education. You know what philosophy says? Before you start anything, the first thing you need to do is doubt. Doubt and reason. Don't believe anything. Always doubt and always reason. That's the only way you can get the education. Now, as you look at the third angel's message now, and we saw that Adam and Eve reasoned that they ate of the tree of knowledge and lost the image of God, how did they get it back, my friends? How did they get back? Well, they realized that it was expensive business to go to the tree of knowledge because it took an animal being slain, which represents Christ being slain, for them to have the opportunity to be restored to the image of God. It needs power. And thus activating the plan of redemption. Now watch this. What does this have to do with true education? This is the beauty. It says here, in the highest sense, the work of education and the work of redemption are what? Are one. Isn't this beautiful? It says, for in education, as in redemption, other foundations can no man lay than that which is laid and that which is what? Which is Christ. So it's saying that our education should be centered upon Christ. Our curriculums should be centered upon Christ. As we're learning anatomy and physiology, it should be focused on Christ. As we're learning this, the, 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 the chemistry of the soil, it should be focused on Christ. As we're learning chemistry in school, it should be focused on Christ. As we're learning English, it should be Christ-centered. All of our education should be locked in and focused on Christ. Amen. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If you notice, most of the time when Ellen White talks about true education, she quotes John 17, 3, which I just quoted. But she also quotes Job 22, verse 21, which says, Acquaint now thyself with him. That's what education is about. Now, I'll take 10 minutes, and I'll share with you some pattern schools. Let me ask first, open screen test. You guys ready? Open screen test. We, 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 the, my question is, where... Was the first school. Now let's find out. It said the system of education instituted at the beginning of the world was to be a model school for man throughout all after time. As an illustration of its principles, a model school was established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was the schoolroom. Nature was the lesson book. The Creator Himself was the instructor, and the parents of the human family were the students. So, question: um, First and foremost, where was the first school? You sure? It's an open screen test. Look at it. All right. All right, let's answer a few more questions. What is needed in a school? We need a classroom. We need a lesson book. We need an instructor, and we need the students, right? So the classroom, the Garden of Eden, lesson book, nature, instructor, create himself, students, parents of the human family. So we see that. But as you look at the first school, it says, as an illustration of his principles, a model school was established in Eden. You guys catch that? 
It was in heaven. So Eden was the first model school, but the original school was in heaven. In fact, let me give it to you in plain language in the book education. Watch what it says here. It says, heaven is a what? Its field of study is what? The universe. Its teacher is the infinite one. And watch what it says now in plain language. A branch of the school was established in Eden. You guys catch that? And the plan of redemption accomplished education will again be taken up in the Eden school. Now, now listen to this, my friend. This is so beautiful. This is a beautiful thought. When we create these outposts, true education schools, we are taking a model of the heavenly school and translating it here on this earth. And it was God's plan, if you read in the book Education, that these home schools, these home-like schools, should be translated all around the world. So when we started these schools, we could actually have a model of the school of heaven. Praise God, my brothers and sisters. And we're told that the teacher was Christ, the infinite one, and the field of study was the universe, and we're going to actually tour the world. We're going to go to Mars and Arcturus and, and, and Pluto, and Christ is actually going to give us true education, my friends, in a world tour. Now let me share with you a few. Um, uh, the, one, the two schools that uh, were known as models here was number one was Avondale and also the Madison School. Madison's College was started in 1904, and these are just some structures. This is Probation Hall. This is the first cottages. And there's a reason why God gave the cottage plan. He said, look, we should not have these large, massive structures. So he gave us a cottage plan. And in the cottage plan, he said it should be spread out, not large structures spread out. It serves as security from fire. It secures from security from infection. In other words, if you have 100 students in one dormitory, you know what happens if there's an infection like what we're going through now? 100 students are infected. But if you have small home-like dormitories with just a few students, let's say four or six students are staying in one dorm, then those six students can be quarantined to their one dorm and not spread the infection all around. So God has wisdom when he gave us these, these instructions. And this is from, again, our simplicity of construction, short time to build. It also develop, developed character because the students were the ones that were actually building the structures. Separating students to lead to self-government. They learn how to govern themselves. They cook for themselves. More willing donors. Uh, because people, are, you know, people can say, look, I can help to build this house for $150,000. And my donation of $25,000 is a large contribution to $150,000. But if I'm building a school that's $6 million, my $25,000 seems like a dust in the, in the sand, right? Doesn't attract from the real work. And they learn how to convert other buildings to, for usefulness. We're doing that right now in Kentucky. We are, trans, uh, we are uh, converting our barn into a home structure. Now, here's some of the Madison School founders. Um, and you notice that Ellen White is in the middle, and this is the only school that she served on the board. The final were, um, were uh, McGann and uh, Ida and Percy McGann, then we had E.A. Sutherland. And um, we're told that the Lord in his providence has brought about the establishment of the Madison School. It said, through the efforts of Brother Sutherland and McGann and a few faithful associates, their labors have been performed under no ordinary circumstances. These men had an experience at Berrien Springs, which was a, a severe one, but the Lord brought them safely through it and made it a means of, a bless, of blessing them. Then it says, they felt that they must go to the south and labor for the needy field. They went out not knowing whither they went, and the Lord guided them to Madison, a beautiful place of 400 acres. For a time, the way of the establishment of the work seemed hedged up. The Lord led his servant through a trying experience, but he saw the end from the beginning. And then it says, when, uh, when some of the brethren ex ex expostulated and labored to discourage them, the Lord encouraged, and the result of the efforts put forth at the place we can see the Lord's blessing rested upon it. Now, I'm just going to skip to the end just to share with you a few things that Madison was doing, and then we'll close out here. Let's look at Madison's productivity. It says, in 1931, the farm produced 5,450 bushels of fruit, 8 tons of grapes. The school canned 6,700 gallons of fruits and vegetables for the use in the cafeteria. By the mid-1940s, Madison had 120 buildings at one time. The institution had an acreage of 906 with 789 acres at Madison and 117 acres at Richtop. There were more than 3,000 apples and peach trees at Richtop. It also owned a farm at Union Hill in Goodlettsville, Tennessee. 
Now, what was the public saying about it? This is from the New Day in June 1938. It says, there should be about 10,000 such practical self-supporting institutions in this country. Such schools will, be great, will greatly reduce the high educational tax levy and certainly would raise the standard of education to a much higher level of practicality. This is what the world is saying about Madison. It says, Madison College is the only self-supporting college in America. It says, receives no country, state, or federal aid. Building grounds and equipment costing 520000 20, represents profits of 27 campus industries operated by students. And this is from Ripley's, believe it or not. They said, believe it or not, this school is the school to be reckoned with. Amen? And in this time, that contribution is about $9,477,000. It says, it says, no student receives a degree until he or she has acquired two skills in any line which seems to fit them, their capacity. Uh, and he surveyed 1,000 graduates. Now watch what this says. After serving 1,000 graduates of Madison, it says, not one among them have been forced to accept help either from the government or private agencies during the difficulties of the Great Depression. You got to think about that. When millionaires and billionaires were lined up during the Great Depression and their money meant nothing and they had to get a few pieces of potatoes to share with their entire family, they surveyed 1,000 Madison graduates and they said not one of them were affected by the Depression. You want to know why? They were learning to be self-supporting. And education more important than this, they could not receive. Those are words of inspiration. That's powerful. In fact, uh, when they surveyed many during the Depression in a country where they had their own wells and their own water system and their, and their own means of electricity, and people thought they were poor and depressed, and, 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 and you, know, you know what they said when, when they went to those regions, when everyone was suffering? They said, how is the Depression affecting you? You know what those people said? What Depression? They were living their normal lives. They were growing their own food. They had their own water source. They didn't know there was a Depression taking place. And while those in the cities were suffering... Let me wrap up. It says, I have seen many schools. This is from Dr. Philander uh, P. Claxon from the U.S. Commission of Education. He says, I've seen many schools on all grades in many countries, but none more interesting than this. Nowhere else have I seen so many accomplished, so much accomplished with what? So little money. They were learning self-supporting work, my friends. It says here, the influence of Madison College has left throughout the world in 1954. Then it says, being in manufactured, or manufactured into 30 different foods, products which, in addition to what was consumed in college, being, uh, bring the institutions a revenue of $60,000 a year, just from beans. You know that translated just from beans? Over a million dollars in 2020, just from beans. The school has a broom factory which manufactured 50 dozen brooms daily using 25 acres of students grown broom corn annually. The school sets the students an excellent example of self-sufficiency. It receives no aid from public funds and seeks none. Twice as many applications are made annually as the institute can receive. Preference is given to those who are poor and are expecting to earn all their expenses as they go. Completely different from modern education. It said there should be a thousand, there should be ten thousand such practical self-supporting institutions in the country. Such schools will greatly reduce the high education tax levy, and certainly will raise the productivity, etc., etc., etc. In closing, it says here, the time will come that all, how many, all, all who live upon the earth we need to understand the cultivating of the land and the building of houses and varied kinds of business. Now somebody says, what does cultivating the land and building houses, what does that have to do with education? Well, let me tell you this. It's going to translate to the educational school in heaven. The Bible says, they shall do what? Build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. But don't forget, the object of education is to get to know Christ better as our personal Savior. Amen. This is life eternal that it might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ who thou hast sent.
That's true education, my friends. Education in the first, second, and third angel's message. Let's pray. Father, thank you again that the simple things of God can profound the world, Lord. All over the world, people came to see what was happening at Madison. And we had set a high standard, a high bar of what our education should look like. But we were warned, Lord, that in the last days, that there will be tremendous pressures put upon Seventh-day Adventists to adopt the worldly policy of education. And unfortunately, we have bitten the bait. But we're told that our schools are prisoners of hope. So we pray, O oh God, that you will raise up the schools after the fashion and order that you desire so that we can carry out the education that you have for us in heaven. But this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. of Israel Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock